through there. It's all on the same document, so you know just scroll through it again. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, a very warm welcome um, on behalf of the Food Foundation and Public Health England. Um, my name is Anna Taylor and um, I head up the Food Foundation. And for those of you that don't yet know us, we're a new independent organisation working on food systems policy solutions, trying to address some of the challenges which the food system faces at the moment and, and consumers particularly. Um, we're a small team, there are some of us here and some of our expert advisors are here and some of our trustees are here, so do come and say hello um, afterwards if you don't know us. Um, so today's event is really about trying to generate discussion and understanding around the evidence behind the policy options to try and curb c sugar consumption in advance of the childhood obesity strategy um, which will be coming out next year. Um, please do contribute your views in the round table. We'd really like to hear the diversity of views that are represented here in the room. Just a few points of, of housekeeping from me. Um, we will be live tweeting, for those of you that um, like to use Twitter. Um, the hashtag is MPSugar. Um, you, a number of you have food items on your chair seats, please do pass them round. They've been marked up with the number of sugar cubes that are in the item. Some of them might be quite surprising, some of them perhaps not, um, but do pass them round. Um, and then a couple of final things. One is um, if you want to connect to Wi-Fi, the username is guest, G-E-S-T, without the U, and the password is palace, but the L is a number one. Um, and then finally, we have a change to the agenda. Unfortunately, Keith Vaz, as MP, has been pulled into urgent business in the House. And um, Lord Rutter has, um, I'm extremely grateful to Lord Rutter for ste stepping in at the last minute. Lord Ricker, excuse me, sorry, Lord Ricker. Um, Lord Ricker has been a, a minister um, in several ministerial positions in the, in the Labour government and was until 2003 the chair of the Food Standards Agency. Um, and I'm really delighted that he's able to make it today. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Anna. Uh, 2013, that was. Uh, Jeff Rooker, dinosaur from the Lords. Uh, Keith's on Ascom's business because of the policing statement. Laura Sands will be here by about 4.30. So, basically, a very warm welcome to everybody involved, whether you're from industry, campaigners, uh, members of uh, either house, because it's very important to have a discussion about this uh, very important subject of, of sugar. Uh, the government prepared in its childhood obesity strategy. Uh, we've got some horrendous statistics, which you'll probably see about children leaving primary school obese. Too many of them are following the example of their teachers, I might add, um, which is a factor that we can't ignore. Um, and we're very pleased that we're here from Public Health England and the latest publication about their findings. There is an opportunity. Uh, to take a lead on this, we always make these fatuous claims that Britain's leading the world in everything, which can't always be true. We did lead on salt reduction. Very, very effectively, until the onset of the responsibility deal. And there's been a slight gap. But the fact is, it can be done. Cooperation with industry doesn't require lots of legislation. So we did set a lead, and the World Health Organization held its uh, anti-salt uh, salt reduction uh, Congress here in, in London. The same can be done with sugar. So where there's a will, there's a way. And I think the evidence is the thing that sort of forces the will. And we're going to get some of the evidence here today. So I'd very uh, like to introduce, to start with, uh, Dr. Alison Tedstone, who's the Director of Diet and Obesity at Public Health England. And I have one small interest to declare. Six years ago, when I joined the Food Standards Agency, she put me off drinking lattes. Alison, it's yours. And I can't quite remember why. I do. Because <laughs> there's so many calories in there. That's right. Um, so, um, uh, Public Health England published the um, uh, uh, report on uh, sugar and um, direction ev um, evidence for action on the 22nd of October. But I just want to talk you a little bit through the history of this. So, um, Public Health England was requested by Department of Health to inform its thinking on sugar. Um, and um, at the first phase of that work was the publication and the um, report from our scientific advisory committee on nutrition on, co on carbohydrates and health. And this is um, a report from the advisory committee that look, took um, 
um, a totality review of the evidence about approach, but quality controlled it. So um, um, many thousands of studies were considered for considerate for inclusion in this report, but at the end of the day, I think the conclusions were based on around 600. <coughs> Um, most people think this report is only about one thing, it's only about sugar, but actually it's about a whole myriad of different carbohydrates, so that's starch, that's all the different fibres we eat and so on and so forth, but I'll just briefly talk um, a bit about the findings on sugar. So um, Sacken, Sacken's key finding was that the uh, amount of sugar we habitually consume in the UK um, is um, leading us to consume too many calories. Um, and um, we have a dire obesity problem and the data shows that in uh, prospective studies and in randomised controlled trials that the consumption of high sugary, high sugar foods um, and drinks is, is linked to um, consuming too many calories and, there, and therefore weight gain and obesity. We see clear evidence as well that too much sugar is associated with um, increased risk of tooth decay. We tend to um, minimise that a bit in a policy sense, but we have almost 30% of our children turning up to primary school with tooth decay. Um, and um, tooth decay affects, affects life chances in, in many ways um, and is not to be diminished. Um, Sacken also found um, evidence from, ran, um, from um, prospective studies that um, sugary drinks increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. So up until Sacken published, finalised its report, we had a recommendation, the public health recommendation was that sugar consumption should not exceed 10% of energy. From, from when Sacken halved that recommendation because of the clear evidence around health risks associated with higher levels of sugar consumption um, and um, have set a new recommendation saying that um, the population should uh, population intake should not exceed a maximum of 5% of energy. But I think we're the first country in the world to set this, to set this recommendation, although the WHO um, did draw similar, similar conclusions. Also, because of the specific evidence um, and clear evidence seen around sugar-sweetened drinks, Sacken very unusually said, actually this food should be minimised within the diet. <coughs> Um, and I'll come back to why that is in a moment. But I can't stress enough how unusual it is. Usually Sacken only make that kind of recommendation of, about avoiding foods when they take clear toxicological issues seen. For example, we recommend that oil, um, women don't consume more than two portions of oily fish a week um, because um, of dioxins and other contaminants in, in our fish supply. I should say before I um, continue, Throughout this talk, I'm going to use the word sugar to mean all those sugars, the cook, the consumer, um, and the manufacturer add to our food. Most of that is sucrose, but, but it's also other sugars, um, including those ones that are somehow seen as being, as being healthy. Um, Second, found no evidence to say that they are, so that includes honey and all the syrups Mary Berry likes to um, tell us in her baking programs are, are not sugars, they are. Um, Sacken also included the, fruit, the sugars that are liberated during food processing and most importantly those are the sugars within, within fruit juice. Um, so when Sacken published their report, all health ministers in, in the UK accepted, accepted their advice. So they are now um, the official um, guidance on, um, on how much sugar we should have. Um, and um, part of that, the Minister was very clear to see very clear um, advice going to parents. We produced advice in terms of grams of sugar, teaspoons of sugar, sugar cubes of sugar. But also we tested the advice, sugar drinks have no place in a, children's, a child's diet, so that's clear, unambiguous, and that actually was received very well by our C2D families that uh, the consumer messing is tested in. So um, I just wanted to very briefly just show you the evidence around um, high sugar foods, we, and these are you, these are mainly um, these are all randomised controlled trials. The control group is often um, uh, people being given a drink that contains no sugar, and the intervention group is a sugar-containing drink. Although there are dietary replacement studies in here, 
And you can see, basically, because the, the um, diamond is a summary of all the data included in this analysis, and it shows that um, the consumption of the high sugar diet is linked to consuming, on average, 200 calories a day more. That's a lot of calories. If you could take those out, if you could um, um, switch people to having lower sugar diets and consuming less calories, that would be a big step towards conquering the nation's obesity problem. So um, what's the journey that the nation needs to go on if we did want to achieve SAC, if we to achieve Sacken's recommendations on the sugar on sugar? And the answer is it's quite a big big journey. This is the sugar intake from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, two years worth of da data in um, purple and in turquoise. And you can see that all population groups are exceeding the, current, the new recommendations, and our children are exceeding them by three times. So that's three times. That, that's um, a, major a major health issue. Also, you can see over the two ways of the data, we've had no reduction in the sugar intake of the population, so there's been, there's been no net improvement. The next thing is, well, if we were to achieve second, second recommendations, what would that mean in economic terms? Um, um, Department of Health did, with Public Health England, an, es an assessment of what that would mean for the savings to the NHS, and the answer is it's about 500 million per year um, if you were to achieve it over a 10-year period. Um, most of those savings are due to um, a, a reduction in the obesity-related conditions, so that's type 2 diabetes and so on. Um, and th there is also in this um, the cost reduction associated with it, less dental care is less, less cavities. But because a cavity costs less to treat than uh, um, type 2 diabetes, it's obviously a smaller sum at the end of the day. So on the 22nd of October, rather surprisingly, I had a call that we would be publishing this report um, at midday at 10.30 in the morning. That was a bit of a, bit of, bit of a shock. <laughs> we had quite a lot to do to get that report out. Um, we actually managed to publish it by 1.30, but uh, luckily the Guardian made the 10 o'clock deadline, at, um, made the 12 o'clock deadline, and it was published on the Guardian website at 12, but not um, the finalised version that we published. The leak did not come from Public Health England. So in this report, this report is not a think piece. We've not taken a, a look at a, a random collection of studies. We've systematically searched the literature or produced uh, or analysed, done separate analysis for the <coughs> us to see how the nation could um, have its sugar intake in, in influence. We've still thought of it on three headings, influences, food supply and knowledge and training. So just talk a little bit about influences. We looked at what's been going on in retail um, over the past two years and looked at use work with Cantal World Panel, which is data from 30,000 households in England. Um, on, um, and they bring home food, it's scanned, so, and then Cantal are unable to link that going on to promote promotions. We asked Cantal um, to compare us with the rest of, with the rest of Europe. Um, and we saw some quite interesting things. We see that England has the most, the UK has the most heavily promoted market on, in Europe. We're purchasing 40% of our food on promotions in this, um, during the two-year period of this analysis. Um, the next country along um, is, um, is around 22, 23%, and that's France and Germany. So that's a big difference. We asked the question, well, what do promotions do? Do they just encourage you to swap one brand of biscuits for another brand of biscuits? The answer to that is no. Over time, they lead to an expansion of food categories, a 22% expansion of food categories. So over time, you buy more biscuits or whatever um, if the promotion, if, then if, the, if promotions did not happen. We asked the question, well, what's going on about, uh, across all food categories in terms of promotion? And we see, and the analysis shows that um, promotions is distorted to high sugar products. Um, there are more promotions going on in the high sugar categories, with a few exceptions. Bags of sugar, the commodity, is not promoted very much, um, um, and um, yet of the nap um, and fruit and veg, some some fruits contain quite a lot of sugar. They're not promoted very much. 
the only high sugar natural product that is promoted a lot are fruit juices. So um, we asked Kantar to estimate what would be the effect of stopping promotions and we estimated um, that uh, on high sugar products, we estimated it would lead to about a 6% reduction um, in, in the take home. In, um, take home. Um, so just moving on quickly, we looked at the effect um, of advertising and marketing and we did this by looking systematically at the literature and also doing key informant interviews. Our children are advertised and marketed to more than they have ever been before. We've seen that from the ASA's own analysis. Um, and they're being marketed to and um, promoted to across all social media. The take-home message from this review is marketing is effective in any form that we can find something that met the quality control criteria to go into our review. So Avergamings, just pick one, they are very effective. We found eight studies that investigated the effect of Avergaming on food choice and food preferences, <coughs> and seven of them showed summer effect. So that's quite, quite consistent evidence to say there is an effect. We, but you still, um, traditional TV advertising is effective, um, and so, so is print advertising. Um, when you look at what that advertising is made up of, adverts that use cartoon characters are effective at engaging children. At the moment, um, the licensed characters can't be used to advertise to children, but the unlicensed characters can be. Um, our sports stars are influential, and that kind of celebrity endorsement does engage with children and affect their food preferences. Um, and um, I could go on quite a long time, I stopped going on about that. But basically, advertising is effective. Um, now, high on the agenda at the moment is sugar's taxes. They have been introduced around the world. Very few countries have produced any kind of evaluation, and there is very little in the peer reviewed literature <coughs> except a little bit from Mexico. We collected um, a lot of data, um, some data by um, go, go, going around the world in a virtual sense to seeing what the effect was um, and asking countries for, for their uh, evaluations. And broadly speaking, everywhere that has introduced some kind of fiscal measure to change the diet has seen some kind of positive effect. By that I mean that sales there's been some reduction in, this, in the sales of the said product that has been, has been taxed. We also see some experimental studies, mainly in cafeterias and restaurants, that broadly support the same conclusion, that price increase, if it is large enough, affects consumption, affects purchases, sorry, this is purchase data, it's not on consumption. So the question would be, well, well can that be sustained, or is it just a short-term thing? And the answer, and we can't answer that question because there's no long-term data available. Um, so we don't know if the health halo effect of introducing a sugar tax is the thing that drives some changes in purchases or it's actually the price effect. I would say in general, though, that the price, the price changes introduced through taxation around the world are much smaller than the large promotional shifts that we see every day going on in our supermarkets, which are often of the order of 30%. So the, we looked at, at um, how to work with the food supply to um, deliver less salt, to, um, salt, the wrong S nutrient, less sugar to people, because there's been a, a large success of the former FSA's um, salt reduction program. Um, where we've seen a reduction in, say, the salt content of bread by 40%, and not many people have noticed it. It's happened by stealth. Um, and the question is, could you do the same, same with sugar? And we, could, we have concluded you can. We think there's a large scope for reduction in the sugar content of food using a structured program. So that's a very different program from the responsibility deal, which is very much dependent on individual products being changed and you don't consider the totality of effect. So Public Health England have advised that a, a structured broad program across um, food groups that is accountable would be likely to reduce the sugar content, but you'd also need to combine it with reductions in portion size. PHE have also drawn various other conclusions about training and, and the possibilities for local action. And I think one of the important things that we've noted that is not fully um, 
capitalised on yet is the power of public procurement. We, pu we procured <coughs> an awful lot of food um, in, in England through the public sector. Most of it does not meet um, standards of public procure standards of public procurement that um, are in, would be seen as healthy. Um, so I kind of talked through this. Uh, we um, uh, PHP baked eight recommendations. Three we're kind of seeing as the most likely to be impactful, and that is control on price promotions, sing, um, a reduction in advertising and marketing of foods, uh, particularly aimed at children. Um, a broad, uh, gradual reduction of reformulation policy that reduces the sugar content of everyday foods and drink, including in the out-of-home sector. Um, that's one of the lessons from the um, salt work, is the out-of-home sector was slow to come to the table. And, we, and then our, our fifth recommendation is that uh, we do see that there is a place for, for um, uh, fiscal measures uh, to reduce um, uh, we believe they would be effective at really reducing purchases, at least in the short term. I'm not going to go through the rest. Um, so I think the most important thing is, and um, um, there's no single solution that would be effective, but it's absolutely clear if you want to reduce sugar intake and therefore affect the nation's obesity levels, which are shockingly high and are happening in all social classes, um, you need to go beyond messaging and information. Better and better food labels won't solve this problem. More and more health campaigning won't solve this problem. The, the, there is clear evidence that um, all those things that are driving us as a nation to purchase and consume too many calories and affecting our food preferences um, would need to be tackled if you want to be serious about this. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. Uh, it's a, a frightening story. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Karina Hawkes. Uh, Karina is about to become Professor of Food Policy at City University and is an expert advisor to the Food Foundation. Karina? Thank you very much. Thanks. I think I'll stand up. I don't know if it was stretch. I'll just, I don't know. Really so I'll just uh, Should I pick through. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to be on that slide for a while, so um, just keep it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for inviting me to, to, to the Food Foundation, uh, for inviting me to give a response to Dr. Ted Stone's overview of, um, the, um, of the evidence package. In reflecting on what Dr. Ted Stone has just said, I want to ask the question, will this evidence package, the sugar reduction evidence package, actually work? Will it work and mean that we in Britain are consuming less sugar. So let's consider this from the perspective of someone living their everyday life. Just for the sake of argument, let's take a, let's take a woman who's in charge of providing food in her family. She gets up in the morning, she gives her kids some breakfast cereal. Those breakfast cereal have got less sugar in them. That's strike one for sugar reduction. She takes her kid to school. Her kid has a primary school, has a healthy school meal because of healthy government procurement. Strike two for sugar reduction. Then she goes to a local authority leisure facility where she is exposed to some healthy messaging. That's also part of the strategy that's set up by Public Health England where she's exposed to some healthy messaging. That's strike three for sugar reduction. She then goes shopping. She walks, she's not tempted in any way by price promotions for sugary products because there aren't any. Instead, she goes straight for the fruits and vegetables and, can, and buys more fruits and vegetables than she otherwise would because they are on promotion. And she doesn't bother buying any sugary beverages. She knows they're not that great anyway. And now they're that much more expensive than the diet drinks and the other drinks sitting right next to them. She doesn't buy any. So that's a fifth strike for sugar reduction. Then she gets her fruits and vegetables, put them into the car, drives to school, picks up her kids, gets her kids home. They have some screen time. There isn't any kind of advertising anywhere through digital media on the TV for any kind of sugary product. That's the sixth strike of the day, where uh, taking away the opportunity for those kids and indeed adults to learn preferences for sugary products. So what we're beginning to see here, and the reason why we should welcome this sugar reduction package, 
is a more joined up approach to sugar reduction to enable people as they live their everyday lives to multiple opportunities for reducing their sugar intake. And that's the kind of consistency that we need to see to allow us in Britain to, shook, uh, to, to shake our sugar habit. So it's to be welcomed. But there's some other things that we need to do that I would call on the government to do if we're really going to have a joined up strategy. And the first thing, and I was in a way quite surprised not to see this in the report, is early years. We know from the evidence that if we expose kids, if we expose babies when they're still inside to a wide range of flavours, that they're going to start to learn to be exposed to a wide range of flavours, the same as the breast milk, the same as being exposed to lots of different types of food being offered while, while you are young. So this means it's not so much about sugar, it's about putting sugar in the context of learning to like and to want a healthy diet more broadly. Now the government is doing a lot in the early years. There was some nice guidance out in, in July, for example, and it is in the Public Health England Outcomes Framework. But we need to join up this taste preference learning early on in life to avoid a situation when you get to the age of 10, you haven't become accustomed to these flavours, you, and so it's easy to fall back on pestering your parents for sweet foods. So we need to build in this early years into the, into the process. The second thing which I think is really important, particularly when it comes to reformulation, is the sugar system, the food system, the way that the sugar supply through the food system. The fact is that the industry has got a huge amount of incentive for putting a lot of sugar into foods. It's cheap, it's widely available. Are there disincentives that we can put into place in the sugar supply to reduce growers from growing sugar, to reduce refiners from refining it, from traders from, training it, uh, from trading it, and from food manufacturers to putting it in their foods? We need a good piece of research that's actually going to identify if there are things we can do to put disincentives for food manufacturers to use sugar in the first place, which is going to then reduce the need for consumer end policies because the food industry isn't just, it just isn't going to want to use so much sugar. So that's the second thing that we need to do. And the third thing um, concerns um, inequalities. This is really important, very, very striking when you read the report about the relationship between sugar intake and deprivation. And this is particularly important given the current challenges we're facing in this country at the moment with food poverty and food insecurity. We need to bring those agendas together. So this is what the report says, and on the next slide, um, really scary uh, association of deprivation with dental care, is this among five-year-olds? And on the next slide, it shows the association between deprivation and <coughs> obesity. So it's not surprising, as the next slide, slide says, that report points out that reducing sugar intake would help reduce inequalities. This is critically important if we're actually going to bring down sugar across the population. So the question is, will the recommendations made in the PhD evidence package do that? I think reformulation, marketing, there are lots of reasons to believe it will. But I think we need to ask our question, that question really, really carefully. Let's imagine again we're a woman from a much more deprived background. There's lots and lots of research to say that this woman knows perfectly well what a healthy diet is. And they want to serve their family good food and proper meals. But just say you go into a supermarket and we might think, oh, price promotions on fruits and vegetables, bound to take account of those because they're cheap. <coughs> but that woman has got a lot of other things going on in her life. She hasn't got a car. She's got to do multiple shopping trips in order to find out the best bargains, get those best bargains. Not only that, but she's fearful of wasting food. If she buys lots of food on promotion and the kids don't eat it, if, which they won't if they're not accustomed to it, then she's wasted a lot of food and that's not economical. So we know from the evidence that that's how women from these backgrounds will behave. So perhaps that particular aspect of the strategy will be less effective than we think it might for women, for families from these backgrounds. So we just need to think a bit harder about that and perhaps think, well, what can we do to accompany that? Perhaps we need a subsidised box scheme that's going direct to that woman's home, which is going to take away some of the risks of buying on promotion and some of the inconveniences of it. 
Take another example. Just say a woman goes to her doctor. It's written in the evidence package that health professionals should be trained in awareness of sugar and healthy eating. So the doctor notices she's a bit overweight and says, you know, you really need to be watching your sugar intake. And the woman immediately feels patronised and irritated by this and doesn't take the blind bit of notice because she's thinking, this doctor doesn't have a clue about all the barriers in my life. So much the better to have some really good commissioned services making every contact count, which again is a policy of the NHS and Public Health England and others. So perhaps to have a commission service of a wellness coordinator, for example, who's properly trained in healthy conversations and actually being able to work with that woman who has these multiple barriers. Or, for example, some really innovative commission services, such as perhaps a food friend, a volunteer from the local community, can go into that woman's house and help provide a kind of social support and the skills that are needed to prepare healthy meals in a very, very small space when you have practically no storage facilities whatsoever. So I would argue that to take health inequalities really seriously, the government needs to think hard about how to implement these policies and make sure they really are reaching those people in need. So to end um, in, in my last slide, just to summarise, can this strategy work? If it's implemented, can the evidence package work? I think it can, but it needs to be the entire package. A single bullet, as Dr. Tedstone said, won't. A single magic bullet isn't, isn't there. There needs to be an increased focus on the earliest years to encourage healthy preference learning to avoid the kid who's just going to be wanting sugar when they get older. Uh, we need good research to see what can be done in the sugar supply system. And we need very concerted action to really make sure we're tackling health inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, we've got a very substantial audience, which is really good to see. Um, can I just ask, is there anybody got to, I'm going to go to the parliamentarians first, if uh, uh, that's okay, for a short comments. But is there anybody got any question of what we might call clarification or anything that's, that jumped out that wasn't clear to start with? No? Right, the answer's, that's... Uh, a plus, certainly have a plus for those in marketing, that's for sure. Uh, sometimes we're told it doesn't work, but this seems to show that it does. Um, <coughs> therefore, brief comments from members of either house. A question or comment? I'll go to the front row, Lord of Bureau. Thank you very much, Lord Rooker. I mean, the only comment I would make is that uh, my granddaughter, who's seven, uh, saw me putting some sugar on my wheat bakes the other morning and said, Granddad! doing and I think you're absolutely right that the focus is that it those early years and we all know the obesity story kids up to primary school healthy and that lovely story you heard this week about the uh, school in Scotland where they run a mile you can get those messages across it's when they get to senior school that the problems go wrong and I think that therefore the focus in any attempt and I won't touch on the sugar, sugar tax and people here will do that more effectively than me but I think that the difficulty in taxing things is across the piece, you lose focus on what you're targeting. After all, somebody's making a cake, particularly a wedding cake, would not be very happy to have a sugar tax that says they can't have icing on their cake. So I think that you need to focus down on the children. And if there are any lessons to be learned from the banned smoking in cars thing, which I was fortunate to have some... Uh, involvement with as a private member's bill, which started in the House of Commons first of all, had very little traction, and then eventually, uh, under the Children and Families Bill, we managed to get it through. And the focus of that is don't try and ban things for everybody. That's the message. Start young, start with the kids, focus on how you can get some public health messages, how to reduce um, sugary drinks uh, on the basis, as you quite rightly said, dangerous to teeth, dental caries, and so forth. So I think that to attempt a, a broad brush <coughs> approach or strategy to reducing sugar for all in today's population is going to fail. I think you need to actually target it to a much younger population and the parents and make sure that they understand the risks to their children. Thanks so much. I'll go to the Commons next and then back to the Lords, see if I can be equal. Ben? Ben Bradshaw, Labour Member of the Health Select Committee. Um, I accept the international evidence for physical measures is compelling 
Uh, and I also accept what you say about the benefits of sugar reduction being uh, felt disproportionately by low-income families. Whether the immediate impact on a family's household budget is likely to be regressive from any increase in food which is consumed in high quantities by that family. Have you given any thought as to how oh, that immediate impact? Yeah, we have given some thought time. about this. I think the point that people are kind of misunderstanding the, standing the point of the nudge. Um, a, a, a sugary drinks tax is not about imposing greater fa financial penalties on anybody. It's about putting in place a financial disincentive towards purchasing that product, that product that nobody needs, towards, um, towards then freeing up money to have a better healthy diet. And PHE don't see the sugary ta drinks tax as being no, it's number in its top three. I mean, we we particularly put it forward because we we saw it as being less impactful than than the other measure uh, than the other measures. Um, uh, there's something I didn't talk about in our prom in the promotional analysis as well. The effect of pro food promotions. We all buy independent of our social class. Forty percent of our take-home food on promotion. There isn't very much of a social class social class effect. That's a, a uniform effect. So everybody is, um, the food industry would paint it as it's saving you money, but actually over time you see it actually f um, encourages more spending, so hence that 22% up percent uplifting food category. If you buy more biscuits than you're attending, then you are, at the end of the day, spending more money that, that is coming out of your budget. Okay, we'll go back to the Lords and then the Commons behind. Okay. Yes, Lord Bauer. Um, I should declare an interest. I'm the president of the British Dietetic Association, um, which does not have a policy on the sugar tax. But anything I say should not be taken to represent their views, because I'm not speaking on their behalf. I, firstly, I think, if you listen to today's debate, you would never imagine the biggest pro problem in nutritional terms in this country is actually malnutrition, not fatness. It's malnutrition particularly among the elderly. And I'd like to see as much time devoted to that particular problem, which is a massive one, as is devoted to this one. Second point I've made is I think we need to be careful of going to excesses. This is a lovely little diagram, isn't it? But the problem doesn't exist at 5%. It only starts at 10% according to the WHO, but it really, if you want to make people seriously take on board a problem, you've got to go to the top end of the problem. Not to say, if you say to everybody, look, you're all having too much, they look around, they say, oh yeah, we're all sinners, you know, we'll go to confession on Saturday together. I think there has to be a much more targeted approach. As far as the sugar tax is concerned, I'm not against any indirect taxation which is popular, and I think this one would be. So I'm not against, personally, a sugar tax, but I'm probably not in favour of it for the right reasons that you would wish me to be in favour of it. So I make those points. And the final point I make, also at the cost of probably being unpopular, is this. Things run in fads, don't they? Sugar came into being because we were against fat. That was basically, sugar was a substitute for fat. Now fat is back in favour unless it happens to be a sausage or a piece of bacon. My view, and I think this does reflect the view of many dietitians, is that what is needed is teaching in moderation, teaching in eating properly and healthily, a balanced diet across all of the food ranges, and that to condemn just one part of the food range is not profitable unless you isolate where you're condemning it for a small section of the population that grossly overconsumes. That's where the problem is, and it's as much a problem with that as it is with any other overconsumption of products in Britain. Thanks so much. We'll go to the Commons and then Lady Jenkins from the Lords. Yeah. Um, I'm Geraint Davis, I'm MP for Swansea West. 
and I can confess I used to work for multinational companies as marketing manager at Colgate Toothpaste. Obviously, we were pushing forward Colgate Toothpaste to stop tooth decay as opposed to sugar and in charge of PG tips. So I do know how marketing works, but I've got a sugar bill which is now uh, being placed in the con Commons. I agree with everything that's been said from the front bench, by the way. But the, what the elements of the sugar bill is uh, firstly to, to require that sugar be denoted in spoonfuls on packaging, because as you'll know, uh, the WHO, which does say 5% now, uh, says that a man should only have a 90 spoonfuls of sugar, which is a can of Coke, and a woman six, which is a Muller light. Now, many people don't know that. And frankly, if you had two pasta sauces and one had six teaspoonfuls and one had three, you would pick the three. The reality is the reason that people are fat is because they don't know what they're eating. And as for poor people, if I gave someone in this room a potato and asked them to make some money out of it, the brightest of you, if that was the, if the motive was profit, would smash it up with salt, sugar, fat, make it into a dinosaur, call it Dennis's dinosaurs, give it a jingle, sell it to children. You'd make a fortune and they would become a beast. But they wouldn't know what they were eating. So first of all, this is the thing about the spoonfuls of sugar. I've got nothing against Mary Poppins, by the way. It's secondly, uh, the bill says that it should be illegal to call high sugar products low fat products in marketing because all the marketeers say oh, these are low fat everything is low, you know it make, doesn't make you fat but it's full of sugar and a third idea was to have a, a global target for sugar a bit like the carbon target so that governments can actually uh, have a strategy of reducing that target that would include taxing sugar either in particular products like fizzy drinks or indeed as, as inputs and this thing about, oh, what about the icing on the cake and the like? The reality is uh, that you can, obviously people can push up the price of the cake if their input goes up, or they can reduce the size of the cake, or they can reduce the amount of the sugar. If I was making hobnobs, and you put a 10% tax on my sugar input, and, a, and you know, and a half of the hobnob was sugar, I mean, obviously that would only be 5%. Uh, so I could, I could cut the 10% and, and keep the price or put the price up slightly. I, I'd make a marketing decision about that. But the fact is, if people know how many spoonfuls of sugar, if you, had a, if you were making pasta sauces and one had six and the other had three, then clearly what that would mean would be the manufacturer would, would, would suddenly start competing on reducing sugar rather than raising sugar. The moment, if it's blind, they've got more sugar in because frankly it tastes better. So you would be prepared to have the three spoonful sugar pasta, because it, even though you get used to the taste, because you'd know it wasn't making you fat. So I, as a manufacturer, would say, well, hold on. I want to compete down the sugar rather than up. So there are, in terms of the answer to the Dr. Karina Hawkes' point, is there incentive structures to put to manufacturers? Well, the answer is consumer empowerment and consumer awareness through sugar. And it, at the point that was made by Dr. Alison Ted said, oh, well, you know, what can you do about labelling? The reality is there's a lot of sophisticated manufacturers colluding together in Europe to make, make labelling on the back of cornflakes and all the rest of it so complicated nobody can understand them in such little writing that no one can read them. And now they're talking about having um, uh, you know, what's it, what is it, a traffic light system, which is completely inept because it's sort of, you know, it's all sorts of arguments about the different bits that go in the traffic lights on the right. So those are my three ideas, the spoonfuls, uh, the, the basic focus on a particular part of advertising, making it illegal to, to advertise something as high fat when it's sort of uh, low fat when it's high sugar, and a global target that you could introduce taxation to. But I agree with everything else that's been said. Thank you, Garen. Before I go to Lady Jenkins, Alison wants to make a correction. And Laura, there's a seat for you here. Well, I don't want to go as far, so it's a correction. Um, I just wanted to pick up on your point about malnutrition. Um, we look after the national statistics, um, and um, we we have for children we have seen over the years um, a smaller, smaller, and smaller percentage of children that are on under the ideal rate weight range. And for adults, that is also true. That does not mean that. Um, malnutrition is not a problem in our very elderly population, but that usually occurs through complex psychosocial reasons, um, not for um, not because of straightforward forward, um, nutritional ones. Um, so we have 64% of our adult population obese or overweight. We have one in five children arriving in primary school obese or overweight, and one in three exiting primary school. That is a much bigger order of problem 
than malnutrition and is costing the NHS primarily through the, the cost of type 2 diabetes a lot of money. So I just felt I couldn't leave that one. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed a bit of it because I had to go to a meeting the far end of the House of Lords very quickly and I'm glad to tell you on the nudge basis that my, that took me over my 9,000 steps for the day. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and um, I was very pleased that Garant talked about fat people because actually th th we're so politically correct nowadays and I'll probably get into trouble again for saying this but I can say it because two, uh, five years ago I was two stone fatter than I am today and the point is if you see a slim person today you think that is a person of enormous self-discipline and that's the truth. I mean I long to pick up a bit of chocolate on the way back here I could be two stone heavier in a minute but um, uh, so I think anything can be done to in encourage people. Um, I've probably missed, which is what I wanted to ask you, um, when the Health Select Committee comes out with their childhood obesity report, I'm sure that the industry will um, find ways of um, uh, denigrating it in some way. And, and, and with, with their enormous resources, um, I mean, and, and welcome to the Food Foundation and to Laura for setting it up because, you know, having more voices in this space is just so important. How can we all uh, kind of fight back when they respond to the particularly the Select Committee report. Thank you. I've got uh, Lord Renard, Lord Ray. We'll probably go, I don't see any more comments. We'll get uh, to the wider audience then. Okay. Thank you. Lord Renard, I'm a Liberal Democrat peer. I'm afraid only 5,444 steps so far today. Um, I think we've learned a lot in this country about reducing tobacco consumption. And I'm very interested in what lessons might be learned from that, because I think it's been very successful. Somehow we've been able to overcome the arguments put forward by the Tobacco Manufacturers Association and their front organisations like Forest. And I wonder what lessons there might be from that. Um, and also, I wonder what might be with the curriculum, starting with children at a very small age. Self-evidently, I have a weight problem. I've always had a weight problem. But when I, at primary school and early as a secondary school, had a weight problem and went home for lunch, my mother did me a very healthy, small lunch, a pork pie with thickly breaded butter. And I knew nothing about that. My mother knew nothing about that not being the best lunch to have. And I just wonder if perhaps at the very early stage when children are learning sums and mathematics, they could learn about teaspoons of sugar, calories, grams of fat, and healthy eating, as well as actually doing more physical exercise, which I realise with hindsight, I didn't do nearly enough of. Okay. Lord Ray, Lord Shannon at the back, and then everybody else. I'll stand up so people at the back. Yeah. Um, I apologise for being uh, great, and I'm miss, missing Alison's talk. But actually, I've heard it before, because she spoke to our all-party food and health forum about two weeks ago. And so I, and I'm making you come up with some absolutely startling new, new, new material, but um, I wonder if I'm right, I hope I'm not, but um, the EU uh, is intending to drop the uh, minimum price for sugar uh, next year, and the year after that, we're going to take the cap of the import of uh, high fructose corn and syrup. Um, and the result of this will be that uh, food manufacturers will be able to get sugar considerably cheaper than they are now. They'll have even more incentive to put it in foods. Uh, and the result of this will be to reverse our aim in the, our health and social care bill to uh, decrease inequalities. will actually have the effect of increasing uh, I wonder if the Department of Health has any influence on our team that uh, works with the EU in uh, using a special clause that there is uh, for public health reasons to oppose um, directions from, from the uh, European Union. And is the government aware of what's going on and is it going to do anything about this? Um, well, food trade is not part of the Public Health England's responsibility or even the Department of Health's responsibility um, and um, really need my <coughs> colleagues from DEFRA to answer it, but it's, um, as my understanding is it's a done deal, the cap will come off in 2017 and um, the, um, it saddens me that we will be having cheaper, the, the commodity will be cheaper in England as a result. 
Lord Shannon. It, it, it's not Lord Shannon, it's Jim Shannon. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just to keep it right. Okay. Sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> the, the, the member for, part, for uh, Strangford in Northern Ireland. Um, I, I, it's always a pleasure to come along to these events, and I apologise I wasn't here to hear everything at the beginning, but uh, I, I declare an interest as a, a type 2 diabetic, therefore one of those who realised he was too heavy, lost the weight, uh, and, uh, and ensured that, that I was trying to achieve those blood sugar counts every morning. My concern is, uh, and it's always been one that's been very much in my mind this last while, that we want to do something really constructive uh, to, to, to stop the, the rise in the numbers of type 2 diabetics and type 1 diabetics as well. But we want to stop uh, obesity uh, at, at every level. Then government, I believe, uh, Mr Chairman, has to do something to make that happen. And that's one of two things. It's either tax on the foods or it's reduction of sugar. Gone is the... the, the, the um, when we were small, my mother used to say to me, a spoonful of sugar helps say, the medicine go down. It's now about 15 uh, uh, spoonfuls of sugar that there is in some of the drinks that we have and lots of the food that we have, even at cereals. So do, does the panel think that we, we, we as government, and I say we as government, I mean as an MP, not one who's in government, uh, but does it, is it important that government takes the steps to increase either tax on foods or, or to constructively and positively reduce the sugar and fat content in foods, ever mindful that the people who are, are susceptible to this most are those people on a lower age, wage bracket, the people who buy the food because it's perhaps cheaper and maybe has a, a high level of sugar and fat content. So therefore, I believe government has to take the, the initiative in this. I would like to get the panel's thoughts upon that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, can I just add, I think there's a lot of talk about inequalities and inequalities in sugar consumption that are there, but actually when you look across socio-economic groups of adults, we are all obese or overweight, independent of our social class. So for adult men that isn't a social gradient in obesity, for adult women that is, but only just, so roughly 20% of any socio-economic um, uh, group of women, more than any hundred social economic group, can't say it. In, uh, so, so over 20% of um, each of the social classes of women will be overweight or obese. So, um, will be obese. Sorry. So that's that's a lot of people. Can I call before I call Baroness Jolly, Professor McGregor, on the front row here? Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, I wanted to say we. Well, I'm chair action on, on sugar. Um, we need to remove 250 kilocalories from the diet to prevent obesity and type 2 diabetes. Now, to do that, reformulation, sorry, I've been asked to stand up by my friend Bernie here. Um, reformulation is by far the most effective. We reckon we can get a 40% reduction in sugar over five years. That's a 100 kilocalorie reduction in the average diet. We reckon that everyone forgets about fat. Fat contributes more to calories than sugar. It's got two and a half times the calories that sugar has, and we want a 15% reduction in reformulation in fat. That will reduce another 100 kilocalories, stopping all marketing or advertising or any form of promotion to children, which we think is acceptable. Why do we ban tobacco smoking when, we don't, we, when more people are dying from the food they eat now in the UK than from tobacco? And then the other thing is the tax. I don't know why people label this tax regressive. It is actually a progressive or dynamic tax because unlike alcohol or before electronic cigarettes, there's an alternative. That is an artificially sweetened drink that is better, is better than a sugar one, better to drink water, we think some worries about it. But you can drink the artificially sweetened one at the same price, so you've got an alternative. So it's actually a progressive tax because it's encouraging the socially deprived to switch from full sugar, which they largely drink, to artificially sweetened drinks. So I, I think that if we did those, the reformulation, 40% sugar, 15% fat, banning advertising, getting our tax in, and also the tax could be used because the thing that Lord Rooker will know is the mechanism for reformulation has been removed by the Conservative government from the Food Standards Agency with the responsibility deal, which has completely and utterly failed, giving the food industry, putting them in charge of making the food better has not worked. And we need to go back to an independent nutritional agency. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bernice Jolly? Yeah. And just very quickly. Very quickly. I, I actually fear the power of the lobby, but I'm sure lots of other people will add their muscle and sort them out. Uh, just before the general election, Comres did a, did a poll and found that two-thirds of Britons support advertising 
of high food, high, high fat, sugar and salt on TV, support the banning of it before nine o'clock. I thought that was quite interesting. And, and, it, and today we learned that 64% of um, adults are obese or, and overweight, so at least there's 30% overlap there. Um, and 90% back cooking and nutrition lessons in schools. Um, so that's uh, quite helpful. For an oldie, I would like, uh, and I know it's children that we have to focus on, I would like something that was legible, because I, I'm at the stage where you're sort of peering at the side of, of packages, and I, and I do. Um, I, I now read things really, really closely, um, and, and I'm appalled about the amount of sugar in things. And finally, public procurement can work. Somebody mentioned public procurement. Uh, certainly in Cornwall, uh, our major hospital only now serves healthy food. So, uh, but, but it took quite a lot of people saying it'll never work, and, and they also purchase locally. Okay, thanks so much. Um, parliamentarians around here, anyone here from the outside like to put the case for sugar to start with? Well, it's a, you know, I, I, mean, I assume there's people from industry here. Is there anyone got a view? Well, I'll take the first hand up then, that lady at the back there. I'll have to point, okay? <laughs> Got the um, my name is Diane Armitage, I work for the National Farmers Union and there's quite a lot of sugar actually growing in the UK, um, but we only grow about 50% of the sugar actually consumed. Um, I think Alison and a few people here mentioned uh, about the reform and that there's going to be lower sugar prices post 2017 and that's actually affecting farmers already because um, the price has reduced already this year that they get, and that's reduced the amount of um, sugar being grown in the UK by 29% already. But even if it becomes so low in Europe, there's still a lot, most of the sugar comes from really poor countries across the world, um, so less developed countries. So I think it'd be very difficult to um, push re regulations and incentives in place that even if you affected the farmers in Europe, there's still a worldwide problem where people really need the income from growing sugar across the world. Thank you. Next. First hand, yes, lady there, in the centre of the row. Thanks. Uh, Louise Ansari from Diabetes UK. Uh, we'd like to commend Alison and PHE on the report and we uh, would like to see action taken across all the recommended areas. Um, my question really is that I meet quite a few manufacturers of, uh, of products containing lots of sugar. Some of them have made lots of effort to try and reduce the, the levels of sugar in them. But then you get to a point where people say, unlike salt, it becomes technically very difficult, it puts consumers off, you know, there are much bigger obstacles. I'm wondering if the panel have got a view on that. Um, I think the obstacles, there are some obstacles for some things. It's quite hard to take sugar out of sweeties. <laughs> they don't end up being sweeties. Um, but we have seen um, some of the food industry reduce portion sizes as a different way of do, doing, it, doing it, and that's to be applauded. Um, I think um, generally, though, there's quite a scope for sugar reduction um, and the technical differences, technical challenges. Um, are perhaps being placed too much at the forefront at the moment, um, and I think there's a little way to go before you hit those. We've seen um, a 4% reduction in some sugary drinks. We've seen bigger reductions in others. 4% reductions has happened without the addition of sweeteners, and nobody's noticed. But our leading drinks, Purveyor, who I won't name, reduced its sugar content by 5%, that would be a significant contribution, and I would be surprised if anybody noticed it. Thanks. Gentleman there, and then the lady at the back. Uh, my name is <coughs> my name is Tam Fry. I'm here representing the National Obesity Forum. We're in the middle of a discussion as to what level the tax should be. We are fundamentally uh, pro having a tax. Uh, we've heard 10%, we've heard 20%, and therefore my question is not only to the panel, but also to the lawmakers of the country and also to the general audience, what level do you think is sustainable? What would be accepted? 
in figures. I mean, PHE have concluded um, there's no, would there be no point below 10%, um, and the higher, the better. Yeah, that's fair enough. And there was, uh, yes, lady with a hand up in the middle. Hiya. Um, I work for Sharon Hodgson MP, but what I'm about to say is not from Sharon, it's from me. So, um, surely the biggest problem starts with the corporation. So, there's a lot of marketing at the minute that says low sugar. Well, it's not, it's only a teaspoon less of sugar. I think a lot of people don't know that. They think they're choosing the healthy option. Um, for example, in this, it says that fruit juice is one of your five a day. Well, I bought a little lunch pack carton of juice the other day that had 25% of my sugar intake in. Well, I had two of them yesterday, so I already had 50% in my juice, but it was counted as one of my five a day. So surely that's a massive contradiction that should be dealt with by the government first before we start t taxing. Um, five a day is being reviewed as part of, we have a whole load of work and this is only part of it that we've pushed out, five a day and fruit juice advice um, is being reviewed. And the conclusions around fruit juice is that 150 mils counts as a portion. That is less than you probably bought in your little in your little carton. Um, a little personal challenge is to start thinking about how much 150 mils is, and it's not very it's not very much. Um, ch for young children, particularly, fruit juices are an issue. They are leading contributors of sugar intake, and many children are having much more than 150 mils. I think, though. For older, older children and um, for adults, it's less of an issue. Um, I mean, it might be a bit of a social class thing. But. Well, lady in the corner there. Hi, um, Patricia McAvelly, Head of Nutrition at Children's Food Trust. Just a couple of things. One is the point of fact. There are the school food standards in place which provide a framework that are mandatory for all schools, except for one cohort of schools in England, which were, due to their funding agreements, academies, that were set up um, between 2010 and two, 2014. Um, I'd be interested to know what the panel will think, or others in the room, in relationship to making sure that they are mandatory for all children, so they can grow up and have access to healthy food within school. And secondly, as a point of fact, there have been guidelines food and drink guidelines that the Trust developed with the early years and health sector for um, early year settings in place since 2012. And those guidelines are very, very clear and give providing evidence in terms of helping how to limit sugar, as do the school food standards. Whenever you want to work with the education sector, and remember we've got a large education sector out there, they need to be helped with what they can do, not what they can't do. So I'd, I'd advise in terms of anything, in terms of helping consumers, providing a guidance in terms of what they can do. Thanks. Yep. Dan Crossley from the Food Ethics Council. Um, I'd echo, welcome the uh, report from Alison and also the extra suggestions from Corona, which I very much support. Um, just two questions. One is, um, how important is, is it to think about the substitution effect um, so, if clearly, um, a sort of sugar is a complex beast, as we've learnt today. Um, how important is it to avoid a, an oversimplistic uh, get rid of sugar? Um, but, but we need to think what, what people are replacing it with, if anything. Um, and secondly, how optimistic are you that your recommendations will be implemented? Shall I answer that one? Okay. So, um, when um, the randomised controlled trials that SACN have reviewed reviewed basically says that there is something about sugar that seems to drive towards overconsumption and that when 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 you replace it with other when you substitute it with other nutrients you reduce that overconsumption drive. I'm kind of a wee bit oversimplifying. Um, so um, yeah you do need to think about substitution and when we our advice about reformulation is that that needs to be underpinned by um, other other reformulation goals that do not um, lead inadvertently to increasing fat levels, for example. One of the things that people talk a lot about, well, in my world, <laughs> um, is the is the sugar fat seesaw. This belief that um, a, a low fat yogurt will inevitably be high sugar. We analyse a lot of products, and actually, that it, it just isn't on the whole true. It's a risk, but it's not on the whole true. So it's perfectly possible with careful uh, um, work by the food industry not to inadvertently 
just make fat worse and you know fat um, the nation is consuming too much saturated fat as well as too much sugar it's just that this report happens to be on sugar could I just um, pick that point up look I, I, I there was a point made earlier about fat about sugar being a fat and it's true sugar has become a kind of fat moving on from, from fat but that's why it's important to put this sugar story in the context of a healthier diet. Mm. And, and that's the point I was making earlier about encouraging you know, what, kids sh what should kids be eating, what should adults should be eating that they, they model to their kids. So this sugar strategy should be seen as part of, of building up a healthy diet. And that doesn't mean that we should be having reformulated processed foods as part of our diet. Sure, they can be part of our diet, but we also need to be encouraging um, uh, other parts of the diet, non-processed food as part of the diet, so it doesn't just have to be about, about reformulation. So I, I think this, this fo the, the, fo the concept should always be increasing the healthiness of the diet more broadly. Just a point made about the progressiveness or aggressiveness of the sugar tax. I'm on the advisory committee for the evaluation of the Mexican sugar tax, and there we see that it's, it's the wealthier people who are paying the tax more because they are continuing to purchase, um, albeit in reduced quantities, but continuing to purchase relatively more sugary beverage than people on lower incomes. So the decline is greater among people on lower incomes. So they're paying less of the tax. So, so that, that's, that's good news. And I, and I think uh, some consideration should be given, to, given that's the case, to earmarking that tax and using it on healthy commission in the NHS or using it to support health promotion efforts. I think there's a lot of potential um, to think um, to think that through as well. And just to pick, pick up on the point about the price of sugar and intervening in agricultural policy, immensely complicated system. It's not just an easy, let's, let's stop sugar beet production, we've, we've solved it. Not at all. But the main influence on the price of sugar in this country is what sugar costs in Brazil. Uh, that's the most important, it's a single influence on sugar prices. And, uh, you know, how you meant to sort of work with Brazil, uh, well, uh, it's a, it's a global, very complex system, and that's why I'm an advocate of doing some really good research to try and help identify where the disincentives are best going to best going to come from. Thank you. Before I ask, uh, I'll come to you. Here. Before I ask Lord to one up, I'll give one question. It relates to one of the early slides of Alison. What is it that makes Britain so susceptible, way <coughs> out ahead of everybody else, falling for promotions? I think you mentioned 40% and the next country was 22%. That's quite a gap. So what's so special about the suckers <laughs> in the UK or Britain um, falling for promotions? Is there, is there a factor? I, 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 I don't, we don't know because we've just done an analysis of how it is. I, mean, I think it's quite interesting though that it's independent of social class. I think that's quite mm -hmm. an interesting thing, that so we all love a promotion. Um, I, um, we, we muse in the report about we having a cheap food culture, basically, in England. We do have, uh, historically, we have the cheapest food crisis now than we've ever had. So we have this kind of perfect storm of a very heavily promoted market, lots of adverts, and, um, and, cheap, and really quite cheap food going on. Um, but as to why... Okay. I, think, I think the point is it's not just about why consumers are responding, it's about why we have so many price promotions in the first yeah, place. Exactly. And actually when you look at the regulations in France and in Germany, for example, they, they were, didn't allow lost leaders. Whereas we in Britain allowed and permitted lost leaders. In France, for example, they didn't allow lost leaders. So there's a whole load of regulations on the retail sector in other European countries that actually prevent manufacturers and retailers from doing the price promotions in the first place. But we had a much more liberal regime that enabled people to then get hooked because once they were started, you get accustomed to them, and that's what the evidence on sales promotion says. So I think that's why we need to be looking at actually what a border regulatory regime is around uh, around promotions and retail setting. Um, I don't I don't think many are true loss leaders, as in the sense that they're being sold at a loss. Um, um, I'd be surprised, I'm not sure, but I'd be surprised it's not like um, some of the classic loss leading stuff no, that you're right. has gone on, gone on in the past. It's just loss leader, that was an example of how the regulatory regime... Mm -hmm. uh, Which, the way the food industry works to get around all the regulations it can. 
I shouldn't really say that. I'll take the last, <laughs> the last contribution from the lady over there. Um, the Stephanie Wood from School Food Matters. Um, interestingly, I'd really, really welcome some clear guidance on fruit juice versus sugary drinks because I think fundamentally parents do want to do the right things and there is a real danger that they're going to switch from sugary fizzy drinks to fruit juice thinking they're going to be doing the right thing. So I hope that somebody's going to come up with some clear information there. And I really want to just applaud the government for a moment because they've made a massive commitment to children's health with universal infant free school meals and I truly believe that it's a fantastic way to normalize healthy eating and long may it continue. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask Alice and Karina if there's any last points they want to make before I ask Laura to wind up before you're invited to drink the sugar free wine at the back. <laughs> Um, alcohol is a major contributor to sugar <laughs> I just would like you all to know that fact. <laughs> just um, to welcome, uh, again to reiterate the, the welcoming for the report, but, but also just to say I hope that this report is integrated in, in some ways into the obesity strategy that will be released. I hope that all the different aspects of the work that Public Health England and the government is doing to create a culture of healthy eating, as someone said, to create a norm when people want to eat healthily. It's all pulled together, so it's all operating in the most efficient and effective way possible to give everybody and to empower people to make the choices that most of us, frankly, actually want to make. Can Thank I make you. a proper comment? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, uh, how about how thing then, um, we, we the devil will be in the detail of, the, of any policy that comes out through the Department of Health. And um, it is, on, it is the Public Health England is saying we think we need broad, deep actions, in, particularly in three areas, uh, for the food chain, uh, price promotion, and advertising and marketing. How effective, though, those are will depend on how broad and deep they are. If, for example, there is just a bit of fiddling around the edges about what goes on in the advertising world at the moment, then that will not change, change many children's food preferences and what parents buy for their kids. If there is only minor um, introduction of um, a comprehensive reformulation policy, then basically we will see what we have seen in recent years, which is no real change, because if you don't know what the right, if you need to know what the right hand and left hand is doing, you need to know what's going on across the totality of the food chain. So it's just to say um, that the breadth and the depth of the, um, of any policy actions will be the proof of the low sugar pudding, so to speak. Thank you very much. Laura. Thank you, and thank you, Jeff, and I do apologise for not being here earlier. And thank you, Alison and Corinna. And this for me, is an interesting debate because when I um, was first selected in 2010 as an MP, I don't think that we were having such an open and forward-looking and, in many ways, aggressive debate about really the absolute impact, the health impact, and the sort of societal impact of sugar. And I think there are many people in this room who have contributed to this and made this happen, not least um, Public Health England, but there are many academics here and people champions of this subject. So it is truly on the agenda, and what is going to be important is the responses that we get from government. But I don't think the subject is going away whatever response government comes back with. So I think that we have got movement, and it is about people in this room to make sure that that movement is pushed even further. I want to say thank you so much for your participation and, and making such an important contribution, but I'd also like to um, thank the team at the Food Foundation. This is our very first event, uh, public event for the Food Foundation. We are the first independent food public policy organization looking at the system and I just wanted to say one reason why both Anna Taylor who is a fabulous new um, chief executive of the organization and I are so passionate about this system is I had a conversation with a non-executive director of one of the very large supermarkets and I asked them how much time around the board do you talk about food how much time do you talk about property and how much time do you talk about financial instruments? 
15% on food, 35% on property, and 30% on financial instruments. I turned around and asked them, are you really in the food business? Because this is a very, very important, it's a very complex system. There are no easy answers, as you rightly say, there's no easy answers to sugar, but there's no easy answers to a food system that has started to deeply change the way we behave and the way, in many ways, our health, our health outcomes. We need to move from a cost-based food system to a value-based food system. And I hope very much that the Food Foundation and Anna and the team will participate with all the rest of the people here in moving us forward to a healthier, safer, um, and much, much sort of happier food system in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.